Hey everybody, Dr. Phil here. So this is going to be a video on multiple regression analysis. So what, what is it? Why would we, why would we talk about it? Why do we use it? So on and so forth. So in, in the previous chapter, we used a single independent variable. So that's just sort of the um, linear, you know, basic regression analysis. Um, you can use that, but it's probably a little more um, perhaps unrealistic because most times there are going to be a whole lot more than one um, independent variable that you wish to study. So now that's what we're going to do. We're going to extend the method to use more than one independent variable. We're going to simultaneously explore the relationship between a dependent variable and the independent variables, determine the, the variables that are not statistically related to the dependent variable, and then just take them out. Um, that's kind of speaking to the stepwise regression. Um, and the result is a regression model that explains the most variance in the dependent variable. Uh, this is one of many tools used in the field of what's collectively known as the umbrella over data science. So a multiple regression with, so they're going to say K, predict, K predictors. You could just say uh, multiple. So you can see um, Y, this is your dependent variable, equals A plus, and then you can see B1X1 plus B2X2. And this could go on technically into infinity, right? So as before, A is the intercept. Um, the value of Y when all the X's are zero. Um, and then B sub J is the amount by which Y changes when X sub J increases by one, um, holding all the other variables to be fixed. And then we have any residuals, which of course is the difference between Y minus Y prime. So we cannot visualize beyond two predictors, right? So you can kind of see that they've, they've done a reasonably good job of this in sort of three-dimensional space here as to you know how the point might be here but then it's we think it's going to be there but it's over there or it's there but it's it's down below so on and so forth so let's take a look at an example so salisbury realty sells homes along the east coast of the u.s so they're interested in how much they might pay for heating costs in the winter their research department selected a random sample of recently sold homes to determine the multiple regression equation which variables are the dependent and independent variables Discuss the regression coefficients. We're, we're going to do all these things. And then what is the estimated heating cost for a home if the mean outside temperature is 30 degrees? There are five inches of insulation in the attic and the furnace is 10 years old. So let's take a look at this. So we have the home. Um, you can see here um, number of houses. We can see the heating costs that they've accumulated. Mean outside temperatures for these 20 houses. Uh, attic insulation for the 20 houses in inches and then the age of the phone is in years for the 20 houses. So think of think of the um, like X sub one. This is the uh, first independent variable. Attic insulation is the second independent variable. The age of the phone is, is the third independent variable. And then the heating cost is the dependent variable. So what we have here is we could call this time series data. You can also call it panel data um, that we can use to formulate a regression equation. So. So what we do is we, this, what you see here, um, in this is just an excerpt from Excel I pulled out for you. A, B, C, D, columns A, B, C, D. This is the data we just saw there. Um, and then I'm just running a regression in Excel. And you can see I've got like my R squared, 0.804, um, so on and so forth. What I really want to show you is what I highlighted down here, which is the, this is the equation, right? So the intercept, 427, temperature is negative 4.583. Insulation is negative 14.831, and then age is 6.101. And you can see where I just, these are the coefficients, right? So I just plug these into the formula. So the formula would be, as we just said, um, and then B sub one is negative 4.583. So we estimate a decrease of 4.583 when the mean outside temperature increases by one degree, when we hold the other, the independent variables, insulation thickness, and furnace age to be fixed. Now the insulation thickness was, as we can see, uh, look at the coefficient for X sub two, negative 14.83. So that of course is a negative effect. Um, the furnace age, this is a positive number, right? Positive 6.101, excuse me. Um, so you can see here, if we plug in some numbers, if we say, well, what if X one is 30? What if X two is five? What if X three is 10? then we get 276 points. So that is basically what we would expect the cost, the heating cost to be, given those, um, given those values for those independent variables. All right, so we know from ANOVA that the sum of, sum of squares total is SST plus SSE. Um, but here in SST uh, for the regression model is denoted SSR. 
So we can think of it as the sum of the squares total is the sum of the regression sum of squares plus the sum of squares error. So think of it like, yeah, the regression is this is what we can explain, and the, but there's also an error term because we, we don't know any of this is actually true. Um, this also accounts for any um, systematic variances as well. So if we look at our heating cost model, if you look at what I kind of highlighted in green here for you, um, you can see our regression. We've got our degrees of freedom. We have our, you can see the sum of the squares here, and then you can see, um, you can see the, the mean square here. We have a F value, 21.901. So the F value is high, so that's good. And then notice that the significance, uh, 0 0.0000. So the multiple standard error of the estimate is similar to the standard deviation. So this describes a typical deviation from Y to Y prime. Okay, so think of this as like the mean square error or the square root of the mean square error. So for example, if we look at the heating cost model, we can see I've excerpted some regression statistics down below for us. We've got the multiple R, we've got the R squared, we've got the adjusted R squared, 0 0.767, that's, that's, the, that's that coefficient of determination. Um, we've got a standard error of 51, just over 51. Um, and that is this, of course, is based on those 20 observations that we pulled from that table. So the coefficient of what we call multiple determination Think of this as the percent of variation in the dependent variable y explained by the set of independent variables. So again, all those x1, x2 through technically infinity. So r squared is the regression sum of squares over the sum of squares total. So like if, if again, if we look at the excerpt from the heating cost model, um, you can see all the, all the information we need here, right? We have the adjusted r squared 0.767. We got the r squared of 0.804. Um, the, an R squared of 0 0.804 is actually a pretty good R squared, just FYI. So the coefficient of determination tends to increase as more independent variables are added to the model, which makes sense, right? Because the more independent variables you add, they, in theory, if they're correlated to the dependent variable, then they're helping to explain more of that variance, right? Um, so what's that gonna what's that gonna do? It's gonna make the error smaller because there's less you have to account for now in the error term. And there's going to be more, more sort of accounted for by the uh, regression um, sum of squares, if you will. Now, it doesn't mean that the added variables are good predictors. That's true. They, they may not, for example, they may not explain a whole lot of the variance, but maybe they just explain a little bit of it. So the error goes down a little bit. Some of the squares regression goes up a little bit, right? Um, you can see down here. So we got just again, we got the heating cost model. Um, so think of it. If we were adding, if we were adding more, uh, let me go back. Sorry, if we were adding more of these variables. Um, then, you know, we might see, um, we might see more of the, um, yeah, there we go. We might see more of the, the error term would go down and the, um, the regression, um, SS would increase because we're just explaining more of the model, if you will. Okay. So let's talk about, um, inference. So what does inference mean? It just means that we are making basically, uh, you can think of an inference as like an educated guess. Um, that like the weather forecasters are technically making inferences about the weather because they don't know that it's definitely going to happen, right? But it's based on the data they have, that is their best guess, if you will. So we can test the ability of the set of independent variables to explain the variation in Y. So think about Y again as the dependent variable. Um, so again, like always, I always list out my, uh, my null hypothesis and then my research hypothesis. Notice the inequality, the research hypothesis. So this is, of course, is two-tailed. If the null is true, none of the independent variables are statistically related to y. Otherwise, at least one of the variables is statistically is related. Okay, so this is where our f f um, f statistic comes back into play. So we're assuming it has an f distribution, which will generally follow like the normal distribution. Um, for the numerator, we can use like we always do. Degrees of freedom can just be equal to k, and then the denominator degrees of freedom can just be equal to n minus um, k plus one. So if we look at the heating cost model, you've got the uh, kind of the regression, um, kind of the regression equation here. Um, we've got our null and we've got our research hypothesis. And then if you look down at the ANOVA, you can see uh, you can see where I plugged in the degrees of freedom. We've got our um, sum of the squared. We've got our uh, mean squared, and then of course we have the F, right? And again, a good a good rule of thumb with F is you want the you want the F score to be as um, as high as possible. If you have a very low F score. 
then there's probably not much significance if you have a high F score. There's probably, there's not always, but there's more likely going to be higher significance, right? So in this instance, we, we can reject the null hypothesis, and thus we are saying we are accepting the research or the alternate hypothesis, right? So we can conclude at least one of the coefficients is zero, and at least one variable is related to the heating cost. Now, we can do a test about the coefficient of a single x sub j, if we, if we choose to. We don't have to, but we could if we, wanted, if we wanted to. So one test for every coefficient in the model. So again, I'm listing out my null hypothesis equals, right, because the null hypothesis says there's no change. And then below it, I'm listing out my research hypothesis that there is a change, hence the inequality. Of course, this is two-tailed. So if the null hypothesis is not rejected, we may want to remove x sub j. Um, otherwise, we might want to keep it in the model. Um, so really, you can kind of sum all this up by saying, well, look, maybe if, we want, if you want to look at the independent variables on an individual basis, um, if they're not significant, then maybe you make a case to say, okay, why do we want to keep them in the model? Maybe we want to just take them out because it doesn't appear that they add anything to the model, right? But if they do add something to the model, obviously we would want to um, want to keep them in, okay? So looking back at the heating cost model, um, you know, we can see that we've got the p-values um, very low for the first two. Um, we've got, the, well, the intercept, you don't really worry so much about the intercept, but look at the temperature, right? Look at the p-value, look at the p-value for insulation, and then look at the age. So the p-value is 0, 0, 0, 0. We're going to reject the null hypothesis. So we're certainly going to want to keep the mean outside temperature. Insulation thickness, again, 0.007. It's very low. We're going to keep that one. The furnace age p-value is 0.14. It's actually 1.148. So that one we could say, maybe we should remove that because it doesn't seem to have much effect on the, uh, on the coefficient, on the overall equation. Okay. The validity of the statistical test rely on several assumptions. Like most statistical methods, there are assumptions that we make. If they are not satisfied, the test could be considered not to be not as robust. Yeah, they could be considered not as robust and maybe misleading is a good word for it. So number one, there is a linear relationship between the variables. Number two, the variation in the residuals is the same for both large and small values of y prime. Number three, the residuals follow the normal distribution. Number four, the independent variables should not be correlated. And then number five, the residuals are independent. Okay, so if we're assuming there is a linear relationship, so what, what do we mean? We're saying that there should be a roughly straight line relationship between the dependent variable and each one separately of the independent variables. So we can easily use a scattergram and verify a linear relationship, right? Um, we can also get some idea about the direction and the strength. So if we're looking at uh, cost versus temperature, you can kind of see this is looks like a negative uh, linear, right? It's kind of moving from top left to the bottom right. And then if we look at cost versus insulation, it kind of looks like maybe you could say, maybe you can make a case. It looks like there's perhaps a slightly positive line there, but they look like they're more kind of all over the place, indicating less, less or no correlation. So if there's a linear relationship, then we could use a residual plot to look at the residuals versus predicted values. And then we're looking for a random distribution with no obvious pattern. So like if we look at this one, we can see that there is obviously no pattern there, right? They're everywhere. Whereas if you look at this one, you can you can kind of see you can kind of see this. Uh, there is what looks to be a pattern there. So the variation in the residuals is constant. All right. And this is what we get into this idea of homoscedasticity. And there's also another thing called heteroscedasticity. So as far as homoscedasticity goes, think of this as the variation around the regression equation is the same for all values of the independent variables. So as you're looking at different values of those independent variables, you don't want some to have much bigger variations and some have small. You're looking for kind of like a steady, um, think about like homo, meaning like the same, the same amount of variation all the way through the range. So we can use the residual plot again if we wanted to. We're looking for the distribution of the residuals to be normal. Um, or there's, there's other ways too. You could use a histogram. You could just do a plot. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's like 20 different ways that we could do this. Now, as we said before, the independent variables should not be correlated. When they're correlated, we refer to this as multipollinearity. Okay. And this doesn't impact the predicted values, but it does impact the estimated coefficients and their tests. This is an important predictive variable if it's found insignificant. 
So a coefficient that should be positive is negative or vice versa. Or perhaps we like we remove one of the variables and then suddenly the other variables change drastically. So multicollinearity does have the potential to invalidate results um, when if that wasn't taken into account and it wasn't controlled for during a regression, then somebody might look at your paper, your research and say, well, you know, I refute this because you had multicollinearity issues. Now, before fitting a model, we're going to obtain correlations among the independent variables. So signs of trouble are correlations greater than 0.7 or less than negative 0.7. So what we're kind of saying here is we want, we know there's going to be some correlation, but we don't want any two, any two things to be so correlated to each other that, that we run into this multi-collinearity issue, positive or negative, as you can see. Um, so we can, we can kind of tell this if it's like, if this is happening by using what we call the VIF the variance inflation factor. So this indicates how much a coefficient standard error is inflated due to multicollinearity. And this is just simply one over one minus R squared. So R squared is from a regression that uses the J, or we'll just think of the I or the X, whatever you want to call it, independent variable as the dependent variable. So if we have a VIF of between four and 10, that indicates this, this presence of um, multicollinearity. If you get a VIF score over 10, then you're basically saying that, okay, we really can't use, we really can't use this because um, you, somebody could argue that the statistical test is not robust. So if we look at the heating cost model, um, we, we've kind of run like a little kind of Pierce and R here we're looking at. Now, notice one thing here, you can see all these ones because it makes sense. Like if we're looking at cost and cost, then that's the same thing, right? So you would expect they would, it would have a perfect correlation. Same with temp, temp. Insult, insult, and age, 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 right? So we're looking at these values like 0 0.812, 0 0.103, 0 0.486. So there's no sign here of any super strong correlations, right? So we can consider a model that uses temperature as the dependent variable and insulation and age as the independent variable, right? So if we do so, then um, if I plug in my numbers, you can see I've got one over one minus R squared. My R squared from over here is 0.241. So you can see I plugged it down here to the uh, denominator and I get 1.32. So 1.32, again, um, if I go back just real quick, what did it say? It said if it's between 4 and 10, indicates there's presence. It doesn't mean you should worry about it. If it's over 10, it's unsatisfactory. So obviously we are way under 10. So this is, this is good. All right. So let's talk about the residuals. Like what is left? Think about what does the word residual mean? What does the word just mean for what's left over, right? So the residuals are independent. Um, that's an assumption we're making of multiple regression. Successive residuals are independent, and there's no patterns to the residuals and no long runs. So what we call autocorrelation occurs when successive residuals are correlated, and this impacts the standard errors. So this is very typical with time series data that kind of repeating itself. Um, and once again, we can kind of look at the residual plot. And you can kind of see here that yeah, there's, there's certainly we don't we don't want patterns, and unfortunately here you can see that there are there is kind of a pattern here, like a negative downsloping pattern. All right, just very quickly, uh, I just wanted to at least mention, uh, just give a cursory mention to qualitative. Think like not like qualitative is in non-numerical independent variables. So we've used quantitative independent variables, which is usually the case for regression. But what if you wanted to use a qualitative variable? So the example, does the home have a garage or not? So here, what we would do is we would come up with a dummy variable for a way to basically code whether the garage is there or not. So think of a dummy variable as a, as it says, um, as it says here, a variable in which there are only two possible outcomes. For analysis, only one of the outcomes is coded a one and the other is a zero. So one could be you have a garage, two, you don't have a garage. And then we can just include that dummy variable in the regression model. This is something that I've done personally in research papers. Um, and it works very well. We can include qualitative variables with more than two values with a series of dummy variables. So we don't just have to use like one and two, like a binary dummy. We could use one, two, three, four, five, however many you want to use. So if we look at the heating cost model, if we added like um, X4, X sub four garage, you can see, we'll, we'll assume that zero is the absence of a garage and one is. So you can see there's probably, it looks like maybe there's a couple more that, have gar that don't have garages. Look at all the zeros relative to the ones that do. And here you can see where I um, just look at everything else is the same. Just look at the bottom here. You can see where uh, we got the garage, we got a coefficient, uh, we got our standard error, 
we've got our T stat and we have a, again a very a very robust p value right it's definitely under 0 0.005 uh, 0.05 excuse me um so we could so what we would then say is okay yeah so this is um the absence or not of a garage is statistically significant related to the the dependent variable so that's just a little bit about how you would handle like qualitative variables because qualitative variables are sometimes good because they add a lot of content they can add context into a study and that's great but the problem is when you're running analysis um you you have to find a way to make the non-numerical make it numerical and that's what we just did there in the example so as we said the p-value for the garages was 0 0.004 that's under 0 0.05, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis, thus we're going to accept the research hypothesis, so we can conclude the garage uh, dummy, the dummy variable is significant. So consider homes with an average outside temperature of 20 and 3 inches of insulation. So then we're just plugging in, you can see I plugged in the 20 and the 3, and then the 0 for the garages, and then 23, and then 1 if they, so this, the first one is if they don't have a garage, 0. And the second one is if they do have a garage and you're going to notice like just how much um how much difference there is with respect to why heating cost all right that's it for this video as always thanks for watching